Okay, now that your patient is angry and you're pretty sure this is cholecystitis, how do you confirm your diagnosis? The gold standard for diagnosis of acute cholecystitis is visualization on ultrasound. So we've brought in a recurring ultrasound bullhorn. Specifically, ultrasound will show a thickened gallbladder wall, reflecting the swollen and inflamed nature of the gallbladder. This is depicted by the unusually thick outer rim of the horn. Ultrasound is great for picking up gallstones as well, but watch out. The ultrasound may not necessarily show stones when they're lodged further downstream, so don't let that fool you. Just look for that thickened, distended gallbladder. When ultrasound isn't conclusive, a radiocentigraphy, aka HIDA, scan can be performed to diagnose cholecystitis. In a HIDA scan, a radio tracer is administered via IV. This tracer is preferentially taken up by bile-containing structures, such as the liver, gallbladder, and bile ducts, so normally you'd expect the gallbladder to light up like crazy. When that doesn't happen, you'll know that something, like a stone, is blocking the cystic duct and preventing the tracer from lighting up the gallbladder. Just take a look at this Haida kid who's hiding behind his hands there. The dye has only made it up to his socks, with no dye anywhere above. That means something is blocking the outlet of the gallbladder and not letting the tracer die inside. Is pathognomonic for a biliary enteric fistula and possible gallstone ileus. Treatment for cholecystitis is surgical removal of the gallbladder, aka cholecystectomy, ideally sooner rather than later. Prior to surgery, stabilization via fluid resuscitation and pain control are the primary goals. Antibiotics are rarely necessary, but if used, should cover the classic enteric bacteria we mentioned previously. Okay, we mentioned that cholecystitis is associated with gallstones 95% of the time. So what about the other 5%? Well, sometimes a patient's gallbladder just doesn't squeeze well enough to move bile and gets inflamed due to bile stasis. This is called acalculus cholecystitis, and it's seen in really sick patients. You can think of it as your gallbladder taking a sick day. Blah. Take a long look in the mirror, my friend. How did it get to this? Acalculus cholecystitis results from bile stasis without actual obstruction, leading to inflammation, distension, and dyskemia. This condition presents with symptoms very similar to typical cholecystitis. Right upper quadrant pain, Murphy's sign, leukocytosis, and fever. Similarly, a thickened and enlarged gallbladder without stones will be seen on ultrasound. This condition is primarily seen in critically ill patients, including patients with sepsis, severe burns, and polytrauma. So if the ultrasound results look like cholecystitis, but the patient is in the ICU, think a calculus first. Right now you may be wondering, if we went to the trouble of calling it acute cholecystitis, does that mean that chronic cholecystitis is a thing? Yes, indeedy. So let's draw in a recurring chronic grandfather clock. Chronic cholecystitis results from repeated episodes of generally mild acute cholecystitis. So we've laid out multiple candles in front of this chronically Italian man, representing multiple episodes of inflammation. The symptoms are all the same. Repeated episodes of postprandial right upper quadrant or epigastric pain. It's just that the timeline is much longer. The big difference here is that chronic cholecystitis is diagnosed by histology, not ultrasound. After cholecystectomy, the treatment of choice for chronic cholecystitis, the gallbladder is sent for pathology. If herniation of the gallbladder mucosa into the muscular wall, called the rokitonsky askoff sinus, is found, then diagnosis of chronic cholecystitis is confirmed. These herniations are depicted here by the herniations of wax, diving from the lumen of the gallbladder right through that smooth muscle layer. Now let's move the gallstone one step further down. What if it makes its way through the cystic duct, but gets caught up in the common bile duct? Cholecolithiasis is the term for obstruction of the biliary tree beyond the cystic duct. That cholecoco part of the word referring to the common bile duct specifically. In the U.S., it's usually caused by a cholesterol gallstone originating in the gallbladder and moving into the common bile duct. Outside of the U.S., it's often caused by brown pigmented stones as a consequence of infection. Remember all that inflammatory riffraff being caused by the brown billy goat? Unlike in acute cholecystitis, 
ultrasound has low sensitivity for obstructions in the common bile duct. Instead, a HIDA scan can be used, a procedure that involves a radioactive dye injected into the biliary tract. More commonly, ERCP is performed to both visualize the obstruction as well as fix the problem, whether that's retrieval of the stone or deployment of a stent to keep the bile duct patent. Let's talk about labs. In patients presenting with symptoms of biliary obstruction, lab results will vary based on the location and the severity of the blockage. First of all, labs may be normal, especially if the obstruction is localized to the cystic duct. If that's the case, you'll likely have to rely on the physical exam and imaging findings we discussed earlier. When the stone gets lodged in the common bile duct, however, the labs start to look a bit funky. So let's stay focused on these two botchy gallstones that have made it further down the biliary tract. AST and ALT are generally elevated early in the course of biliary obstruction. However, as you've seen throughout this GI unit, numerous pathologies can cause the serum AST and ALT to rise. Not very specific. Instead, look for those classic cholestatic labs, alkaline phosphatase, GGT, and bilirubin. These will always be illustrated together whenever we cover a pathology that involves cholestasis, a fancy word for biliary obstruction. Alkaline phosphatase is represented, as always, by the alkphos chalk. This enzyme is present in cells that line the biliary tract, in addition to bone and placental tissue. However, you know that alkphos is leaking from damaged biliary cells specifically when you spot GGT and bilirubin in the serum as well. Gamma-glutamyl transpeptidase, or GGT, is symbolized by the GGT gadget. GGT is a very sensitive marker for biliary obstruction, but it's not very specific. It turns out that any minor episode of liver dysfunction can also cause the GGT to rise. But at least now we can cross bone and placenta off the list. And lastly, the billy goat, symbolizing elevated bilirubin. See the leash and collar? That means it's conjugated. This is called direct hyperbilirubinemia. When there's a greater amount of conjugated versus unconjugated bilirubin backing up into the serum, this should alert you that the conjugating ability of the liver is doing just fine. We're dealing with a more distal blockage. If the stone goes way down the biliary tract, all the way down to the ampulla of Vader or the sphincter of Odi, Amylase and lipase may be elevated as a result of obstruction of the pancreatic duct. Recall that amylase and lipase were covered in our pancreatic luau sketch, represented by an amylase apple inside the mouth of a roasting lipase pig. Gallstones are the number one cause of acute pancreatitis. So in the corner, we've included a recurring pancreatitis sponge, as well as a bocce gallstone lodged in what appears to be the junction of the pancreatic duct and the common bile duct. Kinda ampulla of Vader-esque, wouldn't you say? All right, it's time to finish up our discussion of gallbladder disease with a few of the baddest disorders out there. And I'm not talking Michael Jackson or Power Glove bad either. These pathologies are pretty serious. Let's start with cholangitis, often called ascending cholangitis. This is a general term for acute inflammation of the bile ducts, most commonly caused by bacterial infection. Notice that we've drawn in a few more of those inflammatory candles next to yet another bile gallstone caught in the tract. Any obstruction interfering with the flow of bile through the biliary system can serve as a nidus for infection. It's kind of an unusual place for bacteria to be hanging out, right? These bugs most likely come from the small intestine, migrating backwards through the ampulla of Vader. In the U.S., most cases of ascending cholangitis are polymicrobial, with the most frequent offenders being E. coli, Enterococcus, Clostridium, and Bacteroides. Remember, this is the same crew of bacteria we talked about being involved in the formation of brownstones. In the developing world, cholangitis often involves parasitic infection. Common parasites vary with region, with schistosomiasis common in Latin America and clinorchis in Asia. If your patient is immunocompromised, keep cryptosporidium on the differential as well as it has a nasty tendency to cause cholangitis in immunosuppressed individuals. Patients with ascending cholangitis can become very sick. Expect at the very least an elevated WBC count, fever, and right upper quadrant pain. Sepsis and even shock can develop. The three classic symptoms of cholangitis form what's known as Charcot's triad, 
jaundice, fever, and right upper quadrant pain, each illustrated by this ridiculously fashionable Italian lady in a short coat. A Charcot short coat, if you catch my drift. Jaundice is represented by the chic yellow pantsuit, fever by the flaming red hair, literally flaming, and then right upper quadrant pain. Yep, got her right in the gallbladder. I mean, who just sits around on a bocce ball court like that? Since cholangitis is a bacterial infection, antibiotics targeted towards enteric bacteria are the treatment of choice. Generally, this means broad-spectrum antibiotics with gram-negative and anaerobic coverage. A unique complication of gallstone disease is gallstone ileus. Rarely, a stone, usually in the common bile duct, can cause enough inflammation to erode through the duct and form a fistula into the adjacent small bowel. If the gallstone is large enough, it can actually obstruct the bowel. Crazy! Because the bowel contains air, and the biliary tree normally doesn't, the finding of air in the biliary tree, leaking in through that cholecystoenteric fistula, is pathognomonic for gallstone ileus. So let this aerated bottle of sparkling water remind you of air in the biliary tract. This is most commonly seen on abdominal CT during the workup for other, more common causes of ileus. All right, we've reached our final topic. Gallbladder cancer, a rare but incredibly deadly disease. Gallbladder adenocarcinoma is the most common malignancy of the gallbladder. That doesn't mean it's common overall, though. This is a very rare condition, affecting 3 in 100,000 people annually, with a poor prognosis. Gallbladder adenocarcinoma is more common in older patients, typically in their 70s, women, and in patients with chronic gallstones or cholecystitis, which is why we've placed our recurring cancer crop on the chronic recurrent cholecystitis table. Remember all those little candles? Chronic inflammation of the gallbladder triggers a process called dystrophic calcification that, left unchecked, can progress to frank carcinoma. Dio mio! <gasps> Nani possible! Was the milk expired? Or was it a whacking? Er, offing. Was he offed? You know, like, was he murdered? I mean, just look at that chronically Italian man over there. Acting like nothing happened. This trophic calcification of the gallbladder causes a unique finding on imaging. Porcelain gallbladder. It's called this because calcification of the gallbladder wall causes it to light up on x-ray. This sign of dystrophic calcification mandates removal of the gallbladder to avoid progression to adenocarcinoma. Morphologically, adenocarcinoma can infiltrate into the gallbladder wall or grow like a cauliflower-like or exophytic mass into the lumen of the gallbladder. Clinically, the presentation of gallbladder adenocarcinoma is generally insidious and can appear very similar to cholecystitis, with right upper quadrant abdominal pain, nausea, weight loss, and jaundice. Definitive diagnosis is made on pathology after removal of the gallbladder. Unfortunately, gallbladder adenocarcinoma is incredibly malignant. And by the time of diagnosis, metastasis to other structures has often already occurred.